Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 5 At the Seat of Satan. The first sight she saw on entering her new sphere was a human skull hung on a pole at the entrance of the city. In Old Town and the smaller stations of Kue, Akem, and Aikot Ensa, lying back in the tribal district of Ikoi, the people were amongst the most degraded in Calabar. It was a difficult field, but she entered upon it with zest. Although under the supervision of Duke Town, she was practically her own mistress and could carry out her own ideas and methods. This was important for her, for to her chagrin, she had found that boarding was expensive in Calabar, and as she had to leave a large portion of her salary at home before the support of her mother and sisters, she could not afford to live as the other lady agents did. She had to economize in every direction, and took to subsisting wholly on native food. It was in this way she acquired those simple, Spartan-like habits which accompanied her through life. Her colleagues attributed her desire for isolation and native ways to natural inclination, not dreaming that there was a matter of compulsion, for she was too loyal to her home and too proud of spirit to reveal the reason for her action. One drawback of the situation was the dilapidated state of the house. It was built of wattle and mud, had a matte roof, and a whitewashed interior. She did not, however, mind this condition. She was so absorbed in the work that personal comfort was a matter of indifference to her. Her household consisted of a young woman and several boys and girls, with whose training she took endless pains, and who helped her and accompanied her to her meetings. Schoolwork made large drafts on her time at Old Town, Kue and Akim. Young and old came as scholars. At Kue, the chief man of the place, after the king, sat on a bench with little children, and along with them repeated the Sunday school lessons. He set them an example, for he was never absent. But to preach the love of Christ was her passion. With every visitor who called to give compliments, with every passerby who came out of curiosity to see what the white woman and her house was like, with all who brought a dispute to settle, she had to talk about the Savior of the world. Sunday was a day of special effort in this direction. She would set out early for Kue, where two boys, carrying a bell slung on a pole, summoned the people to service. One of the chiefs would fix the benches and arrange the audience, which usually numbered from 80 to 100. She would go on to a kim, or a kat ansa, where a similar meeting was held. On the way, she would visit sick folk, or call in at farms, having friendly conversation with master and dependents, and giving a brief address and prayer. By midday, she would be back at Old Town, where she conducted a large Sunday school. In the evening, a regular church service was held, attended by almost the entire community. This, to her, was the meeting of the week. It took place in the yard of the chief. At one side stood a table covered with a white cloth, on which were a primitive light and a Bible. The darkness, the rows of dusky faces just revealed by the flickering light, the strained attention, the visible emotion made by a strange picture. At the end came hearty good nights, and she would be escorted home by a procession of lantern bearers. Such service, incessant and loving, began to tell. The behavior of the people improved. The god of the town was banished. Chiefs went the length of saying that their laws and customs were clearly at variance with God's fashions. Mr. Anderson reported to the church at home that she was doing it nobly. When two deputies went out and inspected the mission in 1881-82, they were much impressed by her energy and devotion. Her labors are manifold, they stated, but she sustains them cheerfully. She enjoys the unreserved friendship and confidence of the people, and has much influence over them. This they attributed partly to the singular ease with which she spoke the language. Learning that she preferred her present manner of life to being associated with another white person they were unaware, like others, of the re reason which governed her, they recommended that she should be allowed to continue her solitary course. It was at Old Town that she first came into close contact with the more sinister aspects of mission work, and obtained that training and experience in dealing with the natives and native problems which led her into the larger responsibilities of the future. Despite the influence of the missionaries and the British Council, many of the worst heathen iniquities were being practiced. 
A short time previously, the council had made a strong effort to get the chiefs to enforce the laws regarding twin murder, human sacrifice, the stripping and flogging of women by Igbo runners, and other offenses. An agreement had been reached, but no treaty. No Igbo proclamation could root out the customs of centuries, and they continued to be followed, in secret in the towns and openly in the country districts. The evil of twin murder had a terrible fascination for her. A woman who gave birth to twins was regarded with horror. The belief was that the father of one of the infants was an evil spirit, and that the mother had been guilty of a great sin. One at least of her children was believed to be a monster, and as they were never seen by outsiders or allowed to live, no one could disprove the fact. They were seized, their backs were broken, and they were crushed into a calabash, or water pot, and taken out, not by the doorway, but by a hole broken in the back wall, which was at once built up, and thrown into the bush, where they were left to be eaten by insects and wild beasts. Sometimes they would be placed alive into the pots. As for the mother, she was driven outside the bounds of decent society, and compelled to live alone in the bush. In such circumstances, there was only one thing for the missionaries to do. As soon as twins were born, they sought to obtain possession of them, and gave them the security and care of the mission house. Some of the mission compounds were alive with babies. It was no use taking the mothers along with them. She believed she must be accursed, for otherwise she would never be in such a position. First one and then the other child would die, and she would make her escape and fly to the bush. Mary realized that the system was the outcome of superstition and fear. And she could even see how, from the native point of view, it was essential for the safety of the house. But her heart was hot against it. Nothing indeed aroused her so fiercely as the senseless cruelty of putting these innocent babes to death, and she joined the campaign with fearless energy. She could also understand why the natives threw away infants whose slave mother died. No slave had time to bring up another woman's child. If she did undertake the task, it would only be hers during childhood. After that, it became the property of the master. The chances of a slave child surviving were not good enough for a free woman to try the experiment, and as life in any case was of little value, it was considered best that the infant should be put out of the way. The need of special service in these directions made her suggest to the Foreign Mission Committee that one of the women agents should be set apart to take care of the children that were rescued. It was impossible, she said, for one to do school or other work and to attend to them as well. If such a crowd of twins should come to her, as I have to manage, she would be required to devote her whole time to them. More and more also, she was convinced of the necessity of women's work among women in the farming districts, and she pressed the matter upon the committee. She was in line with the old chief who remarked that them women be the best man for the mission. Another evil which violated her sense of justice and right and against which she took up arms was the trade attitude of the Calabar people. Although they had settled on the coast only by the grace of the Ikois, they endeavored to monopolize all dealings with the Europeans and prevent the inland tribes from doing business direct with the factories. Often the upriver men would make their way stealthily, but if caught they were slain or mutilated, and a bitter vendetta would ensue. She recognized that it would only be by the tribes coming to know and respect each other, and by the adoption of unrestricted trade with the stores, that the full reward of industry could be secured. She accordingly took up the cause of the inland tribes. When Ifik was at war with Kue, sentries were posted on all the paths to the factories. But the people came to her by night, and she would lead them down the track, running through the mission property. At the factory next to the mission beach, they would gather their palm oil kernels and take back the goods for which they had bartered them. In this way, she helped to open up the country. It was not perhaps mission work of the ordinary sense, any more than much of Dr. Livingston's work was missionary work. But it was an effort to break down the conditions that perpetuated wrong and dispeace and introduce the forces of righteousness and goodwill. In all this work, she had the sympathy of the traders, who showed her much kindness. She was a missionary, after their own heart. Chapter 6 In Elephant Country The spirit of the pioneer would not allow her to be content with the routine of village life. She began to go afield and make trips of exploration along the river. The people found her different from other missionaries. She would enter their townships as one of themselves, showing them in a moment that she was mistress of their thoughts and ways, 
and get right into their confidence. Always carrying medicine, she attended the sick, and so many maimed and diseased crowded to her that often she would lose the tide twice over. In her opinion, no preaching surpassed these patient, intimate interviews on the banks of the river and by the wayside, when she listened to tales of suffering and sorrow, and gave sympathy and practical help. Sometimes she remained away for nights at a time, and on those occasions her only accommodation was a mud hut, and her only bed a bundle of filthy rags. A larger venture was made at the insistence of a chief named Okan, a political refuge whom she knew. He had settled at a point on the western bank of the estuary, then called Ebaka, now Jamestown, and had long urged her to pay the place a visit. It was only some thirty miles away, but thirty miles to the African is more than two hundred miles to a European, and Old Town was in a state of excitement for days before she left. Nine a.m. was the hour fixed for departure, but Mary knew local ways, and forenoon found her calmly cooking the dinner. The house was filled with visitors begging her to be careful, and threatening vengeance if anything happened to their ma. At six p.m. came word that all was ready, and followed by a retinue comprising half the population, she made her way to the beach. Women, who were not ordinarily permitted to be viewed by the public eye, waited at every yard to embrace her and to charge all concerned to look well after her comfort. A state canoe sent by the king lay at the waterside. It had been repainted for the occasion in the gayest of colors, while thoughtful hands had erected a little arch of matting to seclude her from the paddlers and afford protection from the dew, and had arranged some rice bags as a couch. The pathos of the tribute touched her, and with a smile and a word of thanks she stepped into her place and settled the four house-children around the feet of the paddlers. More hours were lost in one way or another. The darkness fell, and only the red glow of the torches lit up the scene. Alligators and snakes haunted the spot, but she had no fear so long as the clamor of the crowd continued. At last the command, Sia Uden. The command was answered by the dip-dip of thirty-three panels, and the canoe glided into the middle of the river and sped onwards. In her crib she tried to read by the light of a candle, while the paddlers sang songs in her honor, assigning to her all the virtues under the sun. Ma, our beautiful mother, is on board. Ho, ho, ho. The gentle movement, the monotonous tom, tom, tom of the drummer, and the voice of the steersman became mingled in a dreamy jumble, and she slept the night as soundly as on a bed of down. Ten hours paddling brought the craft to its destination, and at dawn she was carried ashore over golden sand and under great trees, and deposited in the chief's compound amongst goats, dogs, and fowls. She and the children were given the master's room, which always opened out into the woman's yard, and as it possessed no door, a piece of calico was hung up as a screen. The days were tolerable, but the nights were such as even she, used to African conditions, found almost unbearable. It was the etiquette of the country that all the wives should sit as close to the white woman as was compatible with her idea of comfort, and as the aim of each was to be fatter than the other, and they all perspired freely, there was no ventilation. It required all her courage to outlast the ordeals. Lizards, too, played among the matting at the floor, and sent down showers of dust, while rats hopped, skipped, and jumped over the sleepers. Crowds began to pour in from a wide area. Many of the people had never looked upon a white woman, and she had to submit to being handled and examined in order to prove that she was flesh and blood like themselves. Doubtful men and women were forcibly dragged to her by laughing companions and made to touch her skin. At mealtime she was on exhibition to a favorite few, who watched how she ate and drank, and then described the operations to the others outside. Day by day she prescribed and bandaged, cut out garments, superintended washing, and initiated women into the secrets of starching and ironing. Day by day she held a morning and evening service, and it was with difficulty that she prevented the one from merging into the other. On Sabbath the yard became strangely quiet, all connected with it were clothed and clean, and in a corner stood a table with a white cloth, and upon it a Bible and hymn book. As the fierce-looking, noisy men from a distance entered, they stopped involuntarily, and a hush fell upon them. Many heard the story of Christ for the first time, and never had she had a more appreciative audience. In the evening the thong was so great that her voice could barely reach them all, 
and at the end they came up to her and with deep feeling wished her good night and then vanished quietly into the darkness. The people would not allow her to walk out much on account of the presence of wild beasts. Elephants were numerous. It was because of the destruction they had wrought on the farms that fishing had become the main support of the town. Early one morning a commotion broke out. A boa constrictor had been seen during the night, and bands of men armed with clubs, cutlasses, and muskets set off, yelling to hunt the monster. Whenever she moved out, she was followed by all the men, women, and children. On every side she saw skulls rudely carved images, peace offerings of food to hungry spirits, and other evidences of debased fetishism, which, while well, cases of witchcraft and poisoning were frequent. One afternoon, she noticed a tornado brewing on the Cameroon Heights and kept indoors. While sitting sewing, the storm burst. The wind seized the village, lifting the fences, canoes, trees, and buildings. Lightning played and crackled above the hut. The thunder pealed overhead, and rain fell in floods. Then a column of flame leapt from the sky to earth, and a terrific crash deafened the cowering people. Accustomed as she was to tornadoes, Mary was afraid. The slaves came rushing to the yard, shrieking, and at the same moment the roof of her tent was swept away, and she was beaten to the ground by the violence of the rain. In the light of the vivid flashes, she groped her way through the water, now up to her ankles and from the boxes obtained all the wraps she possessed. To keep up the spirits of the children, she started to hymn, O oh, come, let us sing. Amidst the roar of the elements, they caught the tune, and gradually their terror was subdued. When the torrent ceased, she was in a high fever. She dosed herself with quinine, and as the shadow of death is never very far away in Africa, she made all the arrangements in case the end should come. But her temperature fell, and in two days she was herself again. There was a morning when her greetings were responded to with such gravity that she knew something serious had occurred. During the night, two of the young wives of a chief had broken the strictest law in Efik, had left the woman's yard and entered one where a boy was sleeping. As nothing can be hidden in a slave community, their husband knew at once. The culprits were called out, and with them two other girls, who were aware of the escapade but did not tell. The chief and the men of position in his compound and district sat in judgment upon them, and decided that each must receive one hundred stripes. Mary sought out Okon and talked the matter over. Ma, he said, it be proper big palavar, but if you say we must not flog, we must listen to you as our mother and our guest. But they will say that God's word be no good if it destroy the power of the law to punish evil doers. He agreed, however, to delay the punishment and to bring the judges and the people together in a palavar at midday. When all were assembled, she addressed the girls. You brought much shame on us by your folly and by abusing your master's confidence while the yard is in our possession. Though God's word teaches men to be merciful, it does not countenance or pass over sin, and I cannot shelter you from punishment. You have knowingly and deliberately brought it on yourselves. Ask God to keep you in future, so that your conduct may not be a reproach to yourselves and the word of God which you know. Many were the grunts of satisfaction from the people, and the faces of the big men cleared as they heard their verdict being endorsed, while darker and more defiant grew the looks of the girls. With a swift movement, she turned to the gathering. Aye, for you are really to blame. It is your system of polygamy which is a disgrace to you, and a cruel injustice to these helpless women. Girls like these, sixteen years old, are not to be on the age of fun and frolic. To confine them as you do is a shame and a blot on your manhood. Obedience such as you command is not worth the having. Frowns greeted this denunciation, and the old men muttered, When the punishment is severe, neither slave nor wife dares disobey. The old fashions are better than the new. Much heated discussion followed, but at last she succeeded in getting the punishment reduced to the infliction of ten stripes and nothing more. She had gone as far as she dared. Under ordinary circumstances, salt would have been rubbed into the wounds, and mutilation or dismemberment would have followed. She thanked the men, enjoined the wives and slaves to show their gratitude by a willing and true service, and went to prepare alleviations for the victims. Through the shouting and laughing of the operators and onlookers, she heard piercing screams as strong arms plied the alligator hide, and one by one the girls came running into her, bleeding and quivering in the agony of pain, and by and by the opiate did its work and all sank into uneasy slumber. Fourteen days went by, and it was time for the return journey. The same noise and excitement and delay occurred, and it was afternoon ere the canoe left the beach. 
The evening meal, a mess of yam and herbs cooked in palm oil, which had been carried on board, smoking hot from the fire, and was served in the pot, had scarcely been disposed of, when the splendor of the sunset and afterglow was swept aside by a mass of angry cloud, and the moaning of the wind fell threateningly on the ear. A stormy night ahead, said Mary apprehensively to Ocon, who gave a long look upward and steered for the lee of an island. The sky blackened, thunder growled, and the water began to lift. The first rush of wind gripped the canoe and whirled it round, while the crew, hissing through their set teeth, pulled their hardest in vain. They got out of hand, and there was an uproar and fear. Sharing in the panic, the master was powerless. At the sight of others in peril, Mary threw aside her own nervousness and anxiety and took command. In a few moments order was restored, and the boat was brought close to the tangle of bush, and the men, springing up like monkeys into the branches, held on to the canoe, which was now being dashed up and down like a straw. Mary sat with the water up to her knees, the children lashed to her by a waterproof, their heads hidden in her lap. Lightning, thunder, rain, and wave combined to make one of the grandest displays of the earth's forces she had ever witnessed. As quickly as it came, the storm passed and to the strains of a hymn which she started the journey was resumed. She was shaking, and in order to put some heat into her, the chief came and sat down on one side, while his big wife sat on the other. As her temperature rose, the paddlers grew alarmed, and pulled as they had never done in their lives. Dawn was stealing over the land when Old Town was reached, and as Ma was hardly a fit sight for critical eyes, she was carried up by a bush path to the mission house. Ill as she was, her first care was to make a fire to obtain hot tea for her children, and tuck them away comfortably for the night. Then she tottered to her bed to rise some days later, a wreck of her former self, but smiling and cheerful as usual. Toward the end of the year 1882, a tornado swept over Old Town, and damaged the house to such an extent that she had to make a hasty escape and take refuge in a factory. The presbytery brought her to Duke Town. But she became so ill as a result of her strenuous life and her experience in the storm that she was ordered home, and left in April 1888. She was so frail that she was carried on board, and it was considered doubtful whether she would outlive the voyage. With her was a girl twin she had rescued. She had saved both a boy and a girl, but while she was absent from the house for a little while, the relatives came, and by false pretenses obtained possession of the boy and killed him. She was determined that the girl should live and grow up to confute their fears, and she would not incur the risk of leaving her behind.